Hello, welcome to the Principles of Clinical Chemistry Automation. This week we're going to talk about how we have made advancements in the clinical laboratory to use instrumentation rather than doing things manually. At Rasmussen College you're going to notice the labs that you do are going to be very manual and laborious. So you're going to have to run a sample from the beginning to the end doing everything by hand including the calculations. I'm going to talk about what happens inside of the instrumentation that you'll be using when you get to your clinical sites and um, how that pertains to what we're going to be learning in the clinical lab. We're going to learning, be learning the lab about what happens in the analyzer. When you get to your clinical site you'll be using the analyzer. At least you'll have an understanding of what is going on inside of it. All right, the history of automated analyzers. In 1957, a company called Technicon made the first automated analyzer. It was a continuous flow, single channel, sequential batch analyzer. So what it would do is one test on one sample at a time. At that time, it was a big deal because you could do a single test on 40 patients an hour and walk away. So rather than having to do 40 tests by hand manually, you could put on 40 patients, come back an hour later, and you would have the results of those 40 patients ready for you to look at. Then we came across the SMA analyzer, or the Sim Simultaneous Multiple Analyzer. I haven't been working in the lab for that long, maybe about 15 years, but there are some older physicians that would call into the laboratory that I worked at and ask for an SMA panel. What they were referring to was the simultaneous multiple analyzer. What this could do is about 12 of the exact same test at a rate of about 360 to 720 tests an hour. One of the things that was unfortunate about it though is every patient had to have all the same tests. So if it was a basic metabolic panel, all 360 patients got a basic metabolic panel. But it could run multiple samples at once. Obviously a big improvement from the 40 samples an hour. Then in the 70s, we saw the first commercial centrifugal analyzer. It was a spin-off from NASA Space Research. This was an alternative to the continuous flow technology, and these look like disks. In the center of the disk, you'd put the sample. It would centrifuge the disk, and the sample would separate out to the different areas of reagent, and a spectrophotometer would go around, per se, and read each of the different um, spots in that disk. Then there was the Automatic Clinical Analyzer in 1970, introduced about the same time. This was the first non-continuous flow discrete analyzer. So when I talked about the analyzers that would do one test at a time on one patient, then we went to it doing 12 tests, but it had to be the same test on all 300 patients. Now we were able to pick and choose. So if you wanted patient 1 to have a glucose, a cholesterol, and a potassium, and patient two to have uh, glucose, a BUN, and a triglyceride, you would have the ability to pick and choose. So that's the non-continuous flow discrete analyzer. Pick what you want and you could put things on at random access. So if you had 200 clinic patients running and you had a stat from the emergency room, you would have the capability to go in and add that stat specimen and get that done ahead of everybody else rather than having to wait until everything was done. Some things that were different, it had plastic test packs, positive patient identification, and infrequent calibration, so they became easier to use. Thin film analysis technology was introduced in 1976, the year I was born, in case you want to figure out how old I am. Um, I'll have a picture of what that looks like coming up in a minute, of what the thin film um, and how that's different. We still use those today. Kodak Ectochem Analyzer was produced in 1978. It was the first one to use dry slides, which is similar to the thin film analysis in 1976. This is great because there isn't a lot of liquids to use um, and everything gets pitched into a waste basket underneath the analyzer. It was also the first instrument to incorporate computer technology so you could um, type in the patient's um, information. Discrete analyzers have been around since 1980. 
They used all different parts and pieces. We had ion selective electrodes, which we learned about last week. And those, you did things like electrolytes. We have fiber optics, which are more specific. And polychromatic analysis, being able to take measurements at all different wavelengths. A sophisticated computer hardware came into place, and we had software for data handling and much larger test menus. So not only could you do electrolytes, you could do um, regular chemistries such as um, cholesterols and glucoses that I talked about. And you can pick and choose what you wanted in a test menu. Some of the more recent advances, you can see I have a picture on the top right hand side of what's called a bench top analyzer. Some of the ones that were earlier and um, the one you see in the bottom right hand corner of your screen here are very large and take up very large rooms within the laboratory. It's nice for a clinic's office to be able to have a bench top analyzer, as you can see in the top right, because they're small, portable, and easy to operate. They don't need a lot of plumbing, they don't need a lot of electricity, and they're very um, easy to use. Another recent advance are immunochemistry analyzers. We're going to talk about in the next section immunoassays and how they're different from chemistry tests that we do. But immunochemistry analyzers are able to do an assortment of different types of, types of tests. Not only can you do ion selective electrodes, you can do the chemistry testing on kidney function, liver function, but you can do hormones, tumor, marker, tumor markers, specific proteins, and assaying drugs all on the same analyzer. We call these modular analyzers. See down here, we've got, it looks like several pieces all connected together. That is just the case here. There's several different types of analyzers, all connected, able to put one sample on, and all the analyzers will run from that one sample. So, why do we need more automation? Well, we have a higher volume of testing, and we need a faster turnaround time. I've talked about this before, but our baby boomers are getting much older. The older they get, the sicker they're going to be, the more they're going to be in the hospital, and the more health care they're going to need. Therefore, we're going to have to be able to handle a lot more testing. There's um, fewer, more centralized core labs, so um, if you have a very large lab with less staff, you're going to need something that can handle a lot. There's going to be a decline in the use of lab panels and profiles, so there's going to be more and more specific testing. Where Johnny's going to come in and need just kidney function, Billy may come in and just need liver function, um, or, you, or you know, Sally's going to come in and just need a CA-125. So there's going to be you know, different types of things for that. More regulatory standards, there's going to be intense competition amongst instrument manufacturers. So what one manufacturer says they have, another one is going to say they have something better. And we also have decreased operating budgets. So the hospitals are trying to cut back, especially with Obamacare, etc. And um, they're not replacing some staff in some areas, so the budgets are going down, so we want an analyzer that can handle more. So what are some of the advantages to this automation? Well, we can increase the number of tests that we're performing. We can decrease the labor and cost per test. The less hands you have on it, the less expensive it's going to be. Also, less errors. Um, the instruments use very small amounts of sample and reagents as well, where if human hands were doing it, it would be hard to measure out something like 3 microliters. But if an instrument's doing it, it can be done with extreme precision. We have some three basic approaches to automation, and you will need to be familiar with these definitions as you will see them on a quiz. Continuous flow analyzers. This is where liquids are pumped through a system of continuous tubing. They're introduced in a sequential manner. So patient one before patient two before patient three. Centrifugal analysis is capable of doing batches. It uses centrifugal force to transfer liquids from one compartment to the others. Discrete analysis is what you're going to see more often now. This is the most popular type. It can run multiple tests on one sample at a time or multiple samples one test at a time. So it offers the most flexibility. Some of the steps in the automated analysis. The first thing that's going to happen is this patient's going to be drawn by the nursing staff or by the phlebotomy staff. And uh, the sample's going to have to be prepared. This is usually a manual process. If we need whole blood, we don't have to do anything, but if we need plasma or serum, we're going to have to centrifuge it. We're going to have to identify the specimen in some way, shape, or form. Usually the tube that we have collected it in will have a barcode on it, and that has been the best innovation in preventing errors in identification. They usually label the patient sample at the bedside. 
If the patient is sample is going into a different sample cup on the analyzer, that will have to be labeled as well. Then we have specimen measurement and delivery. There's usually circular carousels or rectangular racks that hold the specimens. The specimen um, may be put in a micro sample cup, depending on if it's a tiny itty bitty baby sample. We might have to put it in a special little container. An aliquot is measured through aspiration of the sample into a probe. So a big probe comes down and um, aspirates a small portion, which is also known as an aliquot, out of the original tube and dispenses it into the reaction vessel. After each and every patient is um, aspirated or reagent is aspirated, the probe and tubes are cleaned by the analyzer automatically. Then we have reagent systems and delivery. There's a bunch of different kinds here, and this is where we're, we're going to get into um, that thin layer that I was talking about earlier. First, liquid. Liquid's probably the most common. It's available in bulk volume containers, um, or it can come dry where you have to add water. Lyophilized powder is essentially a dehydrated reagent requiring reconstitution, which is adding water to make it liquid again. We could also have a multi-layered dry chemistry slide I'll show you a picture of here in a second. In a lot of cases, onboard refrigeration is available. If it's a fancy enough analyzer, it will keep the refrigerator, it will keep the reagents cold enough for you. These reagents are then, or chemicals, are um, dispensed via tubing and syringes that um, put the reagents where they're needed. Here's an example of the multi-layered dry chemistry slide. Now this is a slide taken apart, but you can see there's a reagent layer that is embedded in here. It creates a chemical reaction that the analyzer can detect. These are really nice for small laboratories, laboratories that don't have a lot of plumbing, because then there won't be a lot of liquid waste. Think about something like a um, mobile medical unit in Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, the Army does have um, those types of units that do have medical facilities, and they need to have analyzers and things to see how these patients are doing. So they would use something like this, because it doesn't require plumbing and a lot of water. Then we have the chemical reaction phase. It can be mixed. There's reagents and the patient sample are mixed together. It can either, either travel through coiled tubing or have a reaction tray, or sometimes bubbling of air will help um, mix the sample. Um, we separate undesirable substances from the sample. It may be incubated in a heating water bath, and then it has a reaction time depending on the test. So once the patient and the reagent are mixed together, they sit in the analyzer and um, are incubated. We then have a measurement phase. Usually it's some type of ultraviolet fluorescent or flame photometry, although flame photometry is not as common anymore. We use can have ion specific electrodes which measure those electrolytes I talk about, sodium, potassium, and chloride. Rarely do they use gamma counters anymore. Luminometers and uh, visible and ultraviolet light spectrophotometry, so that there goes the ultraviolet light again and fluorescence polarization, chemluminescence, and bioluminescence in immunoassays that we'll talk about in the next section. From there, we have single processing, signal processing and data handling. We need to make sure that the analyzers are accurately calibrated to make sure that we give accurate information out. Multiple instruments that measure the same constituent should be calibrated so that the results are compatible. Um, a lot of the instruments are self-calibrating or you add calibrators to it. Um, usually computerized monitoring is available for many parameters. So all of this stuff in general, if you get anything out of the screen, is controlled by a computer. In very, very large labs, we have pre-analytic automation systems. I've seen these in um, Chicago. I'm sure places like Mayo Clinic and Marshfield Clinic have these types of things. This is a automatic system. So let's say this lady over here is a phlebotomist. I know she's not really dressed like one. She would go and draw a specimen and put it on this little choo-choo train track. It would come through, read what department it needs to go to, send it on the track where it may become um, uncapped or centrifuged, depending on where it needs to go. 
Different aliquots would be sent to the specimen sorter, where it would be separated by immunology, serology, chemistry, hematology, coagulation. And when samples are available to be run, the department that would need to run those samples would be notified to go over and get the sample. The sample would be ready to go. So this would be in a very large laboratory. It would do all the manual work for you. Working in Green Bay, Wisconsin, we do not have any analyzers that do this. Um, I think Door County Memorial has a small system somewhat like this up in the kind of the thumb of Wisconsin is considered Door County. Um, they do have a small specimen sorter system, but um, definitely not as big as what you'd see here. All right, a couple things with laboratory automation with the analytical and post-analytical phases. Um, right now we're seeing ever smaller micro sampling. So this is great for hospitals with NICUs, neonatal intensive care units. We have bigger menus, um, test menus where you can do a lot of tests. Accelerated reaction time so we can get things out fast. High resolution optics for really precise results. Um, improved flow through electrodes. They're not getting clogged up and having to be changed as often. Enhanced user-friendly interactive software for quality control, maintenance, and diagnostics. And the ergonomic and physical design improvements. We're not leaning over to look at things as much as we used to be. And when it comes to data man management in the post-analytical phase, it's nice to have bi-directional communication between analyzers and host computers. Now they're getting as fancy as where if, you know, Dr. Johnson ordered a um, cholesterol and triglyceride on a patient, he can go in the computer system and add on a potassium and kidney function panel, and the analyzer will detect that, take that sample, and just run it automatically without you having to do anything. We have the integration of workstation managers into a communication system, so um, they can talk to each other. Automated management of quality control data. So if the quality not, control is not working, it lets you know. It runs it automatically. User-defined perimeters for many values, and um, they need a gap filler between instrument and laboratory information system. So they're able to talk to each other so that the um, instrument and the LIS can easily, if another patient um, test is ordered, it can talk to the instrument. The instrument can just automatically run it. Okay, that concludes the section on um, laboratory automation. Thank you.